June 15th, 1991. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 71 continued. They say and still believe, in spite of their liberal education in Christianity, that the great god Lono, was, who used to live upon the hillside, always traveled that causeway when urgent business connected with heavenly affairs, called him down to the seashore in a hurry. As the red sun looked across the placid ocean through the tall, clean stems of the coconut trees, like a blooming whiskey bloat through the bars of a city prison, I went and stood in the edge of the water on the flat rock pressed by Captain Cook's feet when the blow was dealt which took away his life and tried to picture in my mind the doomed man struggling in the midst of the multitude of exasperated savages, the man in the ship crowding to the vessel's side and gazing in anxious dismay toward the shore, the... but I discovered that I could not do it. It was growing dark. The rain began to fall. We could see that the distant boomerang was helplessly becalmed at sea, and so I adjourned to the cheerless little box of a warehouse and sat down to smoke and think and wish the ship would make the land, for we had not eaten much for ten hours and were viciously hungry. Plain, unvarnished history takes the romance out of Captain Cook's assassination and renders a deliberate verdict of justifiable homicide. Wherever he went among the islands, he was cordially received and welcomed by the inhabitants and his ships lavishly supplied with all manner of food. He returned these kindnesses with insult and ill treatment. Perceiving that the people took him for the long-vanished and lamented god Lono, he encouraged them in the delusion for the sake of the limitless power it gave him. But during the famous disturbance at this spot, and while he and his comrades were surrounded by 15,000 maddened savages, he received a hurt and betrayed his earthly origin with a groan. It was his death warrant. Instantly a shout went up, He groans, he is not a god. So they closed in upon him and dispatched him. His flesh was stripped from the bones and burned except nine pounds of it, which were sent on board the ships. The heart was hung up in a native hut where it was found and eaten by three children who mistook it for the heart of a dog. One of these children grew to be a very old man and died in Honolulu a few years ago. Some of Cook's bones were recovered and consigned to the deep by the officers of his ship. Small blame should attach to the natives for the killing of Cook. They treated him well. In return, he abused them. He and his men inflicted bodily injury upon many of them at different times and killed at least three of them before they offered any proportionate retalia retaliation. Near the shore, we found Cook's monument. <clears throat> Only a coconut stump, four feet high and about a foot in diameter at the butt. It had lava boulders piled around its base to hold it up and keep it in its place. And it was entirely sheathed over from top to bottom with rough, discolored sheets of copper, such as ship's bottoms are coppered with. Each sheet had a rude inscription scratched upon it, with a nail apparently. And in every case the execution was wretched. Most of these merely recorded the visits of British naval commanders to the spot, but one of them bore this legend. Near this spot fell Captain James Cook, the distinguished circumnavigator who discovered these islands, A.D. 1778. After Cook's murder, his second-in-command on board the ship opened fire upon the swarms of natives on the beach, and one of his cannonballs cut this coconut tree short off and left this monumental stump standing. It looked sad and lonely enough to us out there in the rainy twilight. But there is no other monument to Captain Cook. True, up on the mountainside we had passed by a large enclosure like an ample hog pen, built of lava blocks, which marks the spot where... 
Cook's flesh was stripped from his bones and burned. But this is not properly a monument, since it was erected by the natives themselves, and less to do honor to the circumnavigator than for the sake of convenience in roasting him. A thing like a guide board was elevated above this pen on a tall pole, and formerly there was an inscription upon it describing the memorable occurrence that had there taken place. But the sun and the wind have long ago so defaced it as to render it illegible. Toward midnight a fine breeze sprang up, and the schooner soon worked herself into the bay and cast anchor. The boat came ashore for us, and in a little while the clouds and the rain were all gone. The moon was beaming tranquilly down on land and sea, and we too were stretched upon the deck sleeping and the refreshing sleep and dreaming the happy dreams that are only a vouchsafed to the weary and the innocent. Chapter 72 Young Canicas in New England, a temple built by ghosts, female bathers. I stood guard, woman in whiskey, a fight for religion, arrival of missionaries. In the breezy morning, we went ashore and visited the ruined temple of the last god Lono. The high chief cook of this temple, the priest who presided over it and roasted the human sacrifices, was uncle to Obukia, and at one time that youth was an apprentice priest under him. Obukia was a young native of fine mind, who together with three other native boys was taken to New England by the captain of a whale ship during the reign of Kamehameha I and they were the means of attracting the attention of the religious world to their country. This resulted in the sending of missionaries there, and this Abukia was the very same sensitive savage who sat down on the church steps and wept because his people did not have the Bible. That incident has been very elaborately painted in many a charming Sunday school book, aye, and told so plaintively and so tenderly that I have cried over it in Sunday school myself on general principles, although at a time when I did not know much and could not understand why the people of the Sandwich Islands needed to worry so much about it as long as they did not know there was a Bible at all. Abukia was converted and educated and was to have returned to his native land with the first missionaries had he lived. The other native youths made the voyage, and two of them did good service, but the third, William Canoi, fell from grace afterward for a time, and when the gold excitement broke out in California, he journeyed thither and went to mining, although he was fifty years old. He succeeded pretty well, but the failure of Page Bacon and Company relieved him of six thousand dollars, and then, to all intents and purposes, he was a bankrupt in his old age, and he resumed service in the pulpit again. He died in Honolulu in 1864. Quite a broad tract of land near the temple extending from the sea to the mountain top, was sacred to the god Lono in olden times, so sacred that if a common native set his sacrilegious foot upon it, it was judicious for him to make his will, because his time had come. He might go around it by water, but he could not cross it. It was well sprinkled with pagan temples and stocked with awkward, homely idols carved out of logs of wood. There was a temple devoted to prayers for rain, and with fine sagacity it was placed at a point so well up on the mountainside that if you prayed there twenty-four times a day for rain, you would be likely to get it every time. You would seldom get to your amen before you would have to hoist your umbrella. And there was a large temple near at hand which was built in a single night in the midst of storm and thunder and rain by the ghastly hands of dead men. Tradition says that by the weird glare of the lightning a noiseless multitude of phantoms were seen at their strange labor far up the mountainside at dead of night flitting hither and thither, and bearing great lava blocks clasped in their nerveless fingers. 
appearing and disappearing as the pallid luster fell upon their forms and faded away again. Even to this day, it is said, the natives hold this dread structure in awe and reverence and will not pass by it in the night. At noon, I observed... Oh, yeah. At noon, I observed a bevy, a bevy of nude native young ladies bathing in the sea and went and sat down on their clothes to keep them from being stolen. I begged them to come out, for the sea was rising, and I was satisfied that they were running some risk. But they were not afraid, and presently went on with their sport. They were finished swimmers and divers and enjoyed themselves to the last degree. They swam races, splashed and ducked and tumbled each other about and filled the air with their laughter. It is said that the first thing an islander learns to is how to swim. Learning to walk being a matter of similar, smaller consequence comes afterward. One hears tales of native men and women swimming ashore from vessels many miles at sea more miles indeed than I dare vouch for or even mention. And they tell of a native diver who went down in 30 or 40 foot waters and brought up an anvil. I think he swallowed the anvil afterward if my memory serves me. However, I will not urge this point. I have spoken several times of the god Lono. I may as well furnish two or three sentences concerning him. The idol the natives worshipped for him was a slender, unornamented staff twelve feet long. Tradition says he was a favorite god on the island of Hawaii, a great king who had been deified for meritorious services, just our own fashion of rewarding heroes, with the difference that we would have made him a postmaster instead of a god, no doubt. In an angry moment he slew his wife, a goddess named Kalakalani, Ai. Remorse of conscience drove him mad, and tradition presents us the singular spectacle of a god traveling, quote, on the shoulder, unquote, for in his gnawing grief he wandered about from place to place, boxing and wrestling with all whom he met. Of course, this pastime soon lost its novelty, inasmuch as it must necessarily have been the case that when so powerful a deity sent a frail human opponent, quote, to grass, unquote. He never came back any more. Therefore, he instituted games called makahaki and ordered that they should be held in his honor and then sailed for foreign lands on a three-corner draft stating that he would return someday. And that was the last of Lono. He was never seen any more. His raft got swamped, perhaps. But the people always expected his return, and thus they were easily led to accept 